Last move to the last panel. Uh, I have the pleasure now to present you uh, Henry Stusman. Uh, he is an attorney at law in the city of Sao Paulo and partner of the law firm uh, Pinheiro Net since 2001. He holds a bachelor degree in business administration from uh, Getulio Vargas Foundation, as well as a bachelor degree in law from the University of Sao Paulo. He is a chairman of the legal committee of Abraska, who is uh, the Public Health Corporation's um, group. He practices areas uh, in merger and acquisitions, private equity, capital, and the securities market, in which he has uh, works published in local and international publications. Please, Henry, the podium is yours. <laughs> Professor Ari Osvaldo, thank you very much. My pleasure being here today. My special thanks to Bruno, Mariana, all uh, the guys from Stanford. Uh, it's always a pleasure being here at Fundação Getúlio Vargas. I graduated back in 1991 uh, in business administration, and uh, at the same time I became a lawyer. And I've been a lawyer from that point uh, on. I, I wanted to make a special uh, word prior to uh, commencing my, my, my talk here. Uh, to say that I have here uh, uh, my professor, Antonio Mendes is here, and uh, I made a joke uh, with him. Uh, I thought it would be best for everybody in this room if he uh, would be here in, in my place, because everything I know, I learned uh, from him. Uh, he was my boss, my partner, and we worked together uh, a, a long time. So uh, let's start. Uh, talking about, about private equity and the constraints uh, in the uh, private equity industry. It's there. The, the easiest uh, question one uh, may uh, call uh, to a corporate lawyer is about what the law say, says regarding uh, liabilities in Brazil. Uh, the law is good. The law is precisely good. The law says uh, a limited liability company uh, is a company where uh, the shareholders uh, have a limited liability. This is good. And what about the corporation? Well, corporation is also good. Uh, limited liability also applies to corporation. If, you, if a shareholder pays up uh, the capital, the liability is there. Uh, no liability out uh, of the limits uh, of, the, of the entity, out of the company. Uh, so the main uh, question, the key point uh, regarding uh, private equity investments uh, is regarding liabilities. And liabilities for all uh, stakeholders, not only shareholders and managers, uh, but we will have the opportunity to discuss uh, who else is subject to, uh, to liability. So liability of shareholders and senior managers of a portfolio company plus potential liability of private equity fund managers, other portfolio companies, and limited partners. These other portfolio companies is just weird, and we will have the opportunity to, to discuss this. Uh, this means, uh, the law says, and this means very clearly, that if a, portfo a portfolio company uh, has funds enough and or other assets to pay uh, uh, its creditors, any type of creditor, uh, creditors of any kind, the portfolio company will be the one and the only one liable uh, before its creditors. This is the easy part. But the devil is in, in the practice. And uh, in practice, however, if a portfolio company does not have enough, uh, enough funds and or other assets to pay creditors, especially relating to labor, social security, 
environmental and consumer related matters, deep pocket stakeholders are likely to be called in court to pay. And this means several jointly and unlimited liability. And why deep pocket? The law doesn't say anything about deep pocket, just practice says. Uh, if there are, en there are not enough assets uh, at the company's level, uh, a judge may seek uh, and freeze assets and pierce corporate veil and uh, bring uh, to the proceedings a concept of economic group. This means that uh, whatever name uh, is uh, in the files of the company uh, before the commercial registry, plus any company uh, of any industry that may have the same name, Let, let's say Mitsubishi. We have Mitsubishi elevators, Mitsubishi cars, <coughs> Mitsubishi chairs, Mitsubishi uh, manufacturers. Uh, if there is a labor claim against Mitsubishi, at the end of the day, all Mitsubishi companies, let's say 20 companies, may be added uh, to the legal proceeding and being asked uh, called uh, to pay uh, the debt. Uh, what else in this economic group concept? Uh, a judge, especially a labor judge or a consumer uh, judge, uh, may just uh, search at Google and uh, find out uh, that private equity fund, that private equity firm, what companies in the portfolio uh, of that private equity fund, and then five, six, ten different uh, companies in the portfolio. So uh, the judge just frees assets of any of those uh, completely non or not related uh, to uh, the dispute. Uh, so this is, uh, this is reality. And this is uh, not easy uh, to explain uh, to anybody uh, in Brazil or else elsewhere. And uh, when you are uh, to be involved uh, in uh, various litigations and serious litigation, uh, you may face a reputational adver adverse impact, especially when you are a fund manager and you have many companies in your portfolio. A toxic uh, asset in your portfolio can contaminate uh, the entire portfolio, uh, especially when dealing with this uh, labor, social security, environmental, and consumer uh, related matters. So uh, when we say the pockets, uh, the deep pockets are not only the officers uh, who uh, have been involved uh, with the business, with the management of the portfolio company, but board members, shareholders, the fund managers, uh, even uh, if they are not uh, directly shareholders, or even they are, if they are not directly involved in, in, the, in the management of the portfolio company. As we said, uh, other portfolio companies and uh, also uh, ultimately uh, the investors, the limited partners uh, related to the shareholders. And one may say, is it uh, frequent for an investor domiciled abroad, uh, abroad uh, to be called uh, in a legal proceeding in Brazil to pay uh, the debt. No, this is not uh, common, this is not frequent, but it may happen. And uh, we just got last week uh, a court decision by the uh, STJ, uh, the court uh, that uh, minister uh, Ricardo Villas Boas Cueva uh, belong, and the court uh, frees uh, uh, assets of an attorney, in fact, uh, based in London. And he was the one, uh, his name was uh, on files of a uh, business that went uh, bust here in Brazil. So uh, one may call uh, someone uh, out of Brazil. Uh, to pay this bill. And judicial reorganization uh, and liquidation proceedings, uh, they not always uh, uh, are there as an uh, effective mechanism uh, to avoid or uh, reduce uh, liability. Uh, we, uh, when a company 
is undergoing uh, and goes bad, uh, uh, we, we usually uh, uh, discuss uh, judicial reorganization and liquidation procedures as alternatives. And at the end of the day, uh, it is not uh, all times that those mechanisms, those protections uh, are effective uh, to uh, reduce or avoid uh, liability of shareholders uh, and managers. Uh, so this is the uh, environment uh, in this uh, private equity in industry and uh, in doing business uh, in Brazil. So the environment has uh, downsides, a time and money consuming process uh, when in litigation, very difficult for a private equity firm to cut losses short, especially in case of toxic company in sensitive industries in terms of liability. And uh, here we have a huge difference between uh, uh, industries uh, that are very sensitive uh, and other industries. Let me give you two examples. Uh, when uh, dealing with customers, with consumers, uh, let's say a business that uh, built houses uh, for uh, consumers and uh, the individuals pay monthly installments a uh, certain amount and after three, four or five years uh, the company has to deliver uh, a house and uh, in the middle of the way uh, that business goes uh, bankrupt or goes uh, bad in the sense that uh, we have a, a problem in delivering those house. This is typical that the shareholders must uh, be called up and uh, bring some more fresh fund to capitalize the company because otherwise not only uh, the consumer uh, court uh, with all joint and several and unlimited liabilities uh, will apply uh, labor as well and criminal as well so liability is there uh, so that concept and professor bruno salama just uh, launched a book uh, and uh, and the title is uh, the subject is the end of the limited liability company in Brazil. Uh, mm -hmm. This is for a reason, and the reason is this. Uh, a, another uh, uh, business uh, in an industry which is very sensitive is uh, when you have uh, labor-intensive uh, work. So uh, if there is a, a disruption uh, in the business, then... Uh, thousands of employees go to court, uh, the outcome uh, we know already. So uh, this is the environment. So the, the topic here is contract enforcement, challenges, and substitutes. So let's talk about substitutes. Three minutes. We go very fast on the substitutes. Uh, private equity firm. Uh, if you are very sensitive on having liabilities, uh, you may try the mezzanine structure. That, in the first place, convertible into equity at a later stage prior to a liquidity event. Uh, if you are also sensitive and, uh, and don't want to uh, have direct liabilities on you at the first place, go for a preferred shares uh, structure, no voting structure. You are not there. You have convertible uh, into voting shares only prior to a liquidity event. So in these two scenarios, uh, the private equity investor will have the opportunity to uh, test the temperature before becoming a true uh, shareholder. Uh, what doesn't work is that uh, if a private equity investor with an equity mindset uh, wants to have an indenture, which is a credit document with covenants to protect uh, I I itself, uh, uh, transformed uh, into a shareholders agreement type of agreement with veto rights and influence uh, to the management, that won't work. So these two structures is just uh, a step uh, before uh, you feel like a shareholder. And uh, most likely the private equity investments are, uh, uh, are, true, uh, are being made through uh, three types uh, of acquisitions. 100% acquisition, an acquisition of control, or a minority investment. And uh, the rationale uh, for, for 
for these three uh, types of investments is that uh, liability issue. Uh, so when 100% uh, acquisition, uh, so pretty straightforward. The investor has the management and run the show, has the key uh, at the portfolio company in all aspects. So not only full liability, but also full power and discretion to set priorities in case of distress. I control everything and I solve the problem. When a private equity firm uh, goes uh, control, uh, but not 100%, uh, uh, it is also hard to get rid of liability uh, inputable to controlling shareholders and managers. Uh, the private equity firm will have to find a solution in case of distress and will have to deal also, in addition to that, uh, with minority shareholder interests and uh, to, to, to have a relationship uh, with other shareholders uh, in that place minority. And uh, at the beginning of the private equity in Brazil, uh, most all of the private equity firms uh, uh, went to minority. Even these days, uh, many firms like General Atlantic go minority, goes minority uh, mostly. And uh, when a private equity fund goes minority, uh, the protections are through a very strong shareholders agreement that will have to deal with governance policies, internal controls, information, business plan, influence over management, uh, both at the level of the board and of the level of the board of officers. Uh, the decision making, uh, veto rights, uh, and the exit mechanisms such as liquidation preference, right of first refusal, right of first offer, tag along, put call options, drag along, mandatory registration rights for IPO and deadlock solutions. Uh, uh, and uh, in order, and these, uh, 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 these shareholders agreements to protect private equity firms, and I will take uh, advantage uh, of what uh, Professor Triantis said in the very first panel, uh, they are usually one-sided documents. All these protections, when we, we read those, we, uh, uh, we are under the impression that it's all to one party, uh, which is the private equity investor, and nothing uh, to the other party. This is not true. Uh, this is subject to law, but this has uh, uh, enforcement uh, uh, concerns and problems uh, in practice. Uh, one uh, provision that uh, is quite common to have uh, when a private equity firm is a minority shareholder and wants to cut losses short is uh, at, at the point the company shows uh, a distress which is hard to uh, to get a U-turn on, uh, then uh, let's have a put option under certain circumstances against the founders at a low price, but uh, not without enforcement uh, uh, issues. So uh, in a dispute resolution uh, situation, enforcement issues are uh, uh, basically uh, uh, relating to uh, influence, influence over management. The closer uh, an investor, a private equity investor uh, uh, is to the management, the more liable in case of distress. The put call options uh, always have uh, or brings uh, room for discussion, especially uh, in order to set the price, the strike price uh, for, for the option. If you are to uh, find uh, 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 someone else to uh, make an appraisal, an evaluation. Uh, if you have to discuss the EBITDA, you have to uh, set very clearly in, in the agreement uh, uh, what should be added for the purposes of the EBITDA calculation, what should be deducted, and so on and so forth. Same apply in the drag along provision. It's very rare for someone uh, to apply uh, the law uh, to give uh, grounds uh, to a private equity investor, a minority investor that will have the right to put 100% of the company for sale uh, at a certain price at a certain period of time and at some point uh, why if the controlling shareholder says no, uh, is this a, a, a valid clause to be enforced? So very, uh, lots of room uh, for discussion uh, uh, 
uh, on this as well. Liquidation preference, and this is also liquidity preference. Sometimes the private equity firm wants to have a protection in the agreement that the investment will be returned uh, at a minimum level. And why if, uh, if at the sale of the company there is only uh, proceeds enough to pay back the investor and nothing to pay back the controlling shareholder? Is this valid at that point? Uh, how to uh, settle this prior uh, to have a discussion uh, around this item? Uh, that lot solutions always room for discussion and on this item we usually uh, insert mediation uh, as a first step because uh, after mediation we are not comfortable uh, with either arbitration or uh, courts uh, because at the end of the day we will have uh, something uh, uh, to, to, to chat about this but uh, um, uncertainty uh, is there uh, and many other uh, situation is there. Time over, uh, just going to the end, sorry about this. Uh, repeating what is, wh what is said before regarding discretionary, discretion, discretional uh, clauses, the one inside the document. So uh, we, we, we try to, to draft shareholders agreement in a way that discretionary uh, clauses uh, are not drafted in a discretional way. So uh, try to get rid of, oh sorry, get rid of this uh, deterrent uh, on enforcement. Uh, the Pacta Sun Servanza, many others uh, told already good faith and hidden agenda. Uh, the good faith, many, it, uh, mentioned already before me, but the hidden agenda is also a principle in the, on, on the civil code, and this is uh, 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 important. And this is why you usually add some big boy clause in our uh, investments, uh, investment agreements and shareholders agreement. What does this mean? Uh, this means that if uh, a party, uh, in order to get that deal done, uh, just omit and uh, have, uh, 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 has a mental reserve about, and not to disclose uh, a relevant matter, uh, that if it was disclosed, uh, the agreement was being uh, signed, uh, executed in a different way. So that uh, is also something uh, to be discussed uh, in, in court. And everything together can uh, be uh, discussed uh, in a way that form uh, can be over substance uh, in those types of uh, uh, agreements. And the big boy clause basically says uh, the parties uh, hereby states that they were helped by lawyers. They were informed about uh, what is uh, the contents uh, of the agreements. Uh, they are business uh, persons that uh, are, are aware uh, of the impact of uh, uh, that agreement uh, in his or she's lives. So uh, this is something that uh, we put there I I in order to uh, help uh, discussion uh, uh, regarding enforcement at the time enforcement uh, is need. Uh, here, uh, just problems in court, I'm not, uh, time is over, I, I apologize for that, but uh, court, uh, has its own problems. Uh, arbitration has uh, its own problems uh, in our views and uh, the, the outcome uh, and that I got uh, at a governance uh, congress uh, years ago, uh, the most senior person at the congress uh, at the end, at the very end, uh, said we are here one day discussing government, best practice, uh, whatever, but at the end of the day uh, it's all about the people. Uh, one said this uh, uh, earlier today, and this is true, uh, the best agreement I did in my life was the one subject to litigation, and it was a mess, and, and it took uh, almost 20 years, and uh, doesn't, uh, 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 <laughs> the, the reality is that we, we cannot uh, have everything in the agreement, and uh, the more we try, the more we believe that uh, the parties uh, ha ha have to, to behave here and has, have to want to comply. And marry the right person, become, become partner of the right partner, this decision may have a big impact on your success 
or else may make your life miserable. And I just said, in private equity deals, uh, well-drafted agreements help, but uh, reality is that not everything in the documents will prevail in a litigation scenario under Brazilian law uh, in court or in arbitration. The problem, just one second, and I do apologize for that. The arbitration uh, these days, and my, I, I, I'm criticizing the, 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 the arbitration proceedings because the arbitrators uh, tend uh, not to apply law even when the, when the arbitration clause says that the, the judgment uh, and the decision uh, shouldn't uh, be subject to equality, but should be based on law. And even in these uh, situations, we've seen arbitrators uh, uh, making decisions uh, that they believe are fair decisions. And we are not uh, going to liquidation for corporate matters to find what is fair. We are there to find which is, which is the applicable law uh, applicable to that. Thank you very much. Sorry if I went too long. Well, the next uh, panelist will be Professor Del, uh, Desio Zuberstein. Uh, he is a professor of economics of organization at the School of Economics and Business at the University of Sao Paulo since 1990. He graduated at the Department of Economic of uh, North Carolina State University in 84 and was a visiting scholar at the Haas International Society of uh, New Institutional Economics, uh, Brazilian Agribusiness Association and uh, Agribusiness Council of the Federation of Industries. Fiesp in the state of Sao Paulo. He is also fellow of the International Food and uh, Agribusiness Management Association, former editor of the Journal of Agriculture and Food Economics, business journal uh, uh, at the University of Sao Paulo, and he is member of the board of the Brazilian Agriculture Economic Association. Uh, he teaches courses of economics of organizations, economic of uh, agro-industrial relations and law, economic, and organization. He, his research interests are in the in economic of contracts, economic of uh, agro-based organizations, contracts in agribusiness, and uh, transactions cost economics applied to a strategy. Uh, he organized and uh, direct the program of agribusinesses studies at the University of Sao Paulo uh, and uh, the Center for Studies of Law, Economics and Organization as a joint project with the Law School. He is research associate of the National Council of Science and Technology and uh, he was awarded the Medal of uh, Scientific Honor from by the government of the state of Sao Paulo. Uh, Professor Dessu, please. Oh, I'm still there. <laughs> thank you, Luis Valdo. Thank you for the invitation. Bruno, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Let me start from the big, let, let me start from the end so I avoid the risk of running out of time. Just by saying that uh, what I'm going to do is to present a case, the case of Monsanto, which is a biotechnology company. That the case is designed to illustrate how a company can draft different contracts, con contract architectures in different countries for the same transaction. In that sense, I'm going to illustrate uh, different contract enforcement conditions. Uh, I think that every, all we are talking this morning here, in my view, is about uh, cooperation in society. Uh, the question is how to explain cooperation in a condition of selfishness, opportunism, imperfect authority, imperfect information, and incomplete contracts. So the, the role of the contract is uh, by itself to incentive the engagement of agents in joint production efforts to create value. But the problem is that we live in a world of uncertainty and sometimes 
contracts are not fulfilled. Uh, in some way, under the social point of view, what we are looking when we talk about enforcement is to try to move an equilibrium, a Nash equilibrium from a lower level of uh, production of social value to a higher level of production of social value. So how to uh, give correct incentives for people not to defeat from a relation in terms uh, to generate value. So uh, one way to look to that uh, in the literature, this is very common to see when you have uh, multiple multi-period games, multi-period transactions, uh, we have uh, the, the impact of, uh, the impact of um, reputation to trigger cooperation. So there are many ways in which contracts are seen not as the end of the relation, but just at the beginning of a continuous relation that can or cannot create value. So because of that, let's go to the point of uh, contract enforcement. And uh, uh, two ways of contract enforcement have been discussed here this morning. One, the state enforcement, legal enforcement, with all the imperfections that we've heard, and uh, private enforcement that we see many, many different mechanisms. And one of those mechanisms I'm going to talk uh, present in the case study. But we can talk more. We can talk about, for instance, uh, social norms. Uh, providing incentives for cooperation, or even you can look to how individuals uh, independently will behave, will refrain from break contracts based on some kind of uh, individual moral codes. Well, we know that uh, this is not enough to support a complex society, and we know that uh, state enforcement, private enforcement, social norms are all imperfect. So we have, all, we have to deal with uh, uh, contract uh, breaches all the time. Many authors did that. For instance, Eleanor Ostrom, in his uh, Nobel Prize of uh, 2009, Nobel Prize in Economics, she worked all her life looking to how social norms can uh, promote cooperation. Uh, going, just res resolving the problem of uh, the tragedy of the commons when everyone expects that uh, cooperation will not stay. And she found solutions that do not rely on an external authority. Uh, this is one case. And then we, can we have many cases of self-enforcing mechanisms in which uh, rep reputation will play the role to keep agents engaged in joint cooperation. Uh, one case that we studied uh, uh, was uh, related to the behavior of farmers, cooperatives, how farmers, they behave in terms of a refrain from defeat, from informal agreements, and uh, based on reputation because they expect to have future transactions with their cooperatives. So there are many, many interesting mechanisms that we, when you look to self-enforcing uh, aspects. Private enforcement, uh, they arise more and more relevant when we foresee, when we identify high costs of using the legal, the legal mechanism. For instance, um, one extreme case can be seen maybe in the organized crime. Organized crime cannot uh, refer to, it is illegal to, to, to do formal agreements, so probably they, re, they are based on, uh, 100% of private enforcement specialized at violent mechanisms. Uh, but also courts uh, fail because they cannot observe critical aspects of contract performance or they fail because uh, there is a weak previsibility of the legal system. So private enforcement comes as a necessary and always present uh, motivation. We have done many uh, studies uh, looking to different uh, private uh, mechanisms. And um, for instance, uh, Lazzarini here in my, uh, at my site, we did uh, a couple of years ago a study on licensing contracts of technology and agriculture in which we identified that multiple licenses motivate contractual performance. So. Uh, uh, the idea was that in some way between the same actors having multiple contracts might uh, induce a kind of hostage mechanism in which the, you increase the probability of contractual uh, performance. Uh, we did other studies, for instance, uh, 
uh, we studied 200 cases of litigation between um, farmers and traders. Um, and in that case, uh, was uh, based on the issue that uh, we identified that uh, traders, after a litigant process, they avoid to contract again in future periods with the same farmers. There is a kind of blacklist, which is very common also in business in general. So are very clear and usual mechanisms of uh, private enforcement. Uh, this reminds me one uh, interesting idea from an economist called Harold M. Setz, and he state that if you don't like uh, the bread, then fire your baker. So it's a kind of private penalty that you do, and in business world you, you see that all the time. Now moving towards the, the model that we developed to study uh, the Monsanto case and then to present to you the Monsanto case, we look to the idea of property rights protection and you can protect uh, uh, in every transaction organizations, individuals who protect property rights value either by using the state mechanisms, so the courts, social norms, private mechanisms, or you might leave some value unprotected. The idea behind the, uh, our, our conceptual model is that if you protect, even adding state, social norms, and private mechanisms, if you don't reach a given level of protection, maybe agents will abandon the business. They will prefer not to engage in trying in a contract to generate value. And this is a very basic point in the uh, model that we are going to, to discuss. The idea is that uh, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, the probability of capture of value in any transaction, and I'm going to show exactly how Monsanto does that. And you will use the low cost, the low cost uh, uh, state protection, the legal system, when, um, when you have a given pr uh, probability to, to, to be exploited, to, to, to be expropriated. Uh, it's lower cost because the, the, the state, the government, can rely on, uh, on uh, conditions that are uh, using economies of scale that, that he has to promote uh, the solutions uh, of, uh, of the litigants. But then, maybe that the cost of using the, the legal system grows very high, then you move to private mechanisms of protection. And then, if you go further, and if, if it is really very easy to capture value, so you, if you cannot protect value, maybe you get to the point which is the third arrow, the abandon of value. So the organizations, they just decide no longer to cooperate. So that's why we, we state that the basic motivation of, uh, of these uh, studies that uh, if the government does not protect property rights, at least not as well as the owners require, many alternative uh, mechanisms will arise. And the second point that is presented by other author, which is Joran Barzel, is that this has a very important impact on how organizations structure themselves. And this is what calls my attention. So let me go straight now to the case, the, uh, the GMO um, Monsanto case. The idea here is that Monsanto generates a new technology which is embedded in the seed, in the soybean seed. The, the point is that the farmer can buy the seed and it can be self-reproduced. Farmers can reuse the, the, the soybean grain again and again. And the point is that uh, the company Monsanto owns the intellectual property rights uh, and then they don't like that the farmers will reuse. They call the save seeds for the next season. So how to solve this problem? How to charge for the, for, how to charge the royalties for the technology? A farmer who saves a GM soybean seed captures value in some way from Monsanto. What we did was to look the, exactly the same transaction in, in three different countries. 
in North America, in Brazil, and in Argentina. And going to the end of the story, the point is that we identify that the quality of the institutional environment differs strongly. Let's consider that in Argentina, it's no possible to patent any, any intellectual, uh, there is no intellectual protection for seeds. Uh, in US, yes, it's very strong and the quality of the institutional environment is high. And in Brazil, it was an intermediary situation. The point is that Brazil does have a legal frame to protect intellectual property rights in the genetic business. However, when the genetic modified products entered in Brazil, it was a vacuum. The regulators did not decide for a long time whether or not we should accept genetic mod modified products. And then what happened is that the Brazilian farmers smuggled seeds from Argentina to Brazil. And Monsanto looked to that and said, how can I do to, to harvest my royalties? Because they are just using it. And then comes the private mechanism that I'm going to talk to you. Monsanto, what Monsanto de did was to connect farmers, the processors and the trading companies. And sh the, the company tread credibly the processor and the, trade, and the traders saying, look, if you send a ship, a shipment to any port in the world, we are gonna cut you there. And they did it, giving a very credible signal to them. When they did it, immediately the trading companies and the processors and the cooperatives started to do, to make, uh, con uh, to control what farmers are, 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 are delivering. So it was a very sophisticated mechanism, independent for the local court, but all, uh, of course depending on the international legal mechanisms. So in Argentina, because of the absence of uh, any legal frame, they just declined and they decided to retire. Uh, now they return, but at that time they decided it was in the year 2000, they move out from the country. Let me just go back to that uh, basic model that I mentioned to you that uh, is uh, just uh, you, you rely on, on legal system or you move to private mechanisms or you abandon. So this is ex exactly what we see, uh, what uh, Monsanto did, because uh, in US it was, a pos it was possible to draft individual contracts be be between the company and the farmers. They accept not to use, not to save seeds for the following uh, uh, seasons. In Argentina, which is in the, in the, in the far uh, uh, right-hand side, they just abandoned the market. It's too costly. I cannot protect value. It's very easy to capture my value. They decided to, to, to leave temporarily, then they, they, they came back. And then we have several mechanisms that I'm not going to enter uh, in, in the specific uh, features, but they, they could draft different contracts in countries like Brazil in order uh, not to rely on the, on the local courts and uh, not to ad abandon uh, and to capture part of the value. Of course, that uh, farmers don't like the idea, but this is functioning and, uh, uh, in Brazil. Let me move to the conclusions. And, uh, well, in some way obvious, but uh, just saying again what has been said many times this morning, I think, uh, the efficiency of the courts will affect private strategies on a very predictable way. Uh, private me enforcement mechanisms are widely adopted and it is a very intriguing and a very interesting research topic for people like me to see how, uh, how different mechanisms exist and how, uh, uh, and I like the idea that has been presented at the very beginning of our meeting, there is a lot of innovation in that issue not only technical innovation, but also contractual innovation. Reputation mechanisms are very relevant because they will affect. Let me 
say, social mechanisms depend on reputation. Private enforcement, of course, will depend strongly on relational effects, multi-period transactions. But one thing that we did not talk this morning, and I think that uh, is a, a very interesting issue to move on in research, has to do with public enforcement that cor courts also build or destroy reputation. And this has an enormous impact in the economy. So those are the points, and uh, I think that I'm within my time limit. Yeah, you are on. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dasu. And now uh, uh, we'll have uh, on uh, the podium uh, Sergio Lazzarini who is a well-known, uh, he is a PhD business, in business administration in the field of organization and strategy from uh, John Olin School of Business at Washington University. Uh, he is a full professor and dean of research degree program in, at the INSPE, that is uh, now becoming a university. <laughs> no. <laughs> Now you have two new schools. Uh, where he teaches uh, since 2002, he also uh, was a visiting professor at the Harvard University, HEC in Paris, uh, in Siad, and the University of St. Gallen. He conducts research in the field of our business strategies in emerging markets and uh, relations uh, between private, private companies and public sector. Um, you are also author of uh, two books in this subject. Uh, more recently, he worked in partnership with uh, various nonprofit organizations to disseminate the so-called impact investments to obtain measurable social results as well as financial return. His two experience led to two books, uh, <coughs> Capitalism of Ties, published in Brazil in 2011, and Reinventing State Capitalism, which he co-authored with uh, also Aldo Muzacchio, who is a professor at the Business School at Harvard University. Please. Thank you so much, Erosvaldo, and thank you, uh, Mariana and Bruno, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, oops. Oh, it's there. <laughs> Uh, and uh, thank you all for staying. I know that uh, you know the, I'm the last presenter, and uh, the negative effect of not having had coffee break should be particularly strong now. You know, in the proximity to lunch. So thank you so much. I I changed a bit the title of my presentation uh, because it was not really faithful to my I, and I named it my own presentation. Okay, so it was my fault. So. Uh, because uh, I was emphasizing this issue of shareholder agreements, but it's, it's beyond, I mean, I think that those shareholder agreements are important, but uh, I'm going to discuss a few uh, network-based relationships beyond those agreements. And capitalism of ties is a kind of a translation, I don't know if it's correct, but uh, it's the name of my book in Brazil, Capitalismo de Laços. <laughs> which is, was published in 2010. So back then, 2010, I had this, uh, this book, the idea is pretty simple, so we actually uh, try to, to, to ask who are the owners of uh, the, Brazilian, Brazilian, the Brazilian firms, big Brazilian firms, and uh, what are the implications of that? Um, so essentially what we are um, uh, looking at is uh, you know, ownership relations. I'm focusing more on uh, uh, ordinary shares or voting shares whenever applicable because I mean, I'm interested in control. So here you have uh, two firms, Vale and uh, Embraer, and, uh, and you can, here you see the owners of Vale, very simplified, right? This is a control block. Bradesco, Mitsui, Previ, BNDS, uh, they own Vale. And uh, for that reason, I'm assuming, and here are the ties, for, for, for that reason, I assume that uh, Previ and Bradesco have ownership stakes in uh, Vale, so therefore they, they must have a tie between, so it's kind of a tell me who, who is your 
partner and they'll tell you who is your friend, basically. So it's kind of, this is kind of, this is type of exercise because uh, the idea is that they meet in, uh, in board meetings, so they should interact, etc. So I'm actually retrieving the structure of uh, ties in the economy based on those ownership relations. Uh, when this book came out, there was a newspaper article claiming that this was the Facebook of a Brazilian capitalism, actually, so, uh, uh, which is not far from the, from the truth, because what I'm essentially doing is just uh, to retrieve connections here. And some, um, some concepts here. Uh, first of all, a control block, a group of, uh, of owners uh, with shareholdings in a firm, is what you call a cluster in network analysis, and, uh, kind of an area in uh, sociology and now economics very well known to map uh, those relationships. It's a cluster, it's a group of firms uh, sharing ownership in the same firm and then you have another characteristic which is uh, you have, uh, you know, those are the, the owners of uh, Vale, owners of Embraer and then you see uh, owners kind of the middle, participating in many ownership structures, in our case, governmental actors, right? One of the main conclusions of the book was that the governmental actors, despite all the privatization efforts that we had here in Brazil, they remained central here, participating in many firms, BNDS's Development Bank, Previsa Pension Fund, of a state-owned firm. So that's one of the major conclusions. And, uh, and then there's this concept of small world. In the, uh, actually, it's a concept in network analysis, but we are, we're using it in a corporate sense, meaning that you have clusters of uh, owners linked with each other and connecting, you know, through those connecting actors participating in many firms. It's so a small world because, you know, we have our own groups, and, and we know that uh, there are other groups, but we always have a person who participates in multiple groups anyway. So the, you have the connector and then you have the, those groups. It's a small world because you can easily access other people outside your own group. So, uh, and uh, the manifestation, actually, uh, th those small words are, in our opinion, uh, opinion a manifestation of uh, a very particular characteristic of, uh, of, of, of Brazilian ownership, and the ownership of Brazilian companies, which is uh, control blocks. And here is Uzi Minas. I'm going to talk uh, about Uzi Minas uh, later. But uh, this is uh, right after the privatization of Uzi Minas in 91. Then you have uh, a group of owners here as a consortium, very common in Brazil. About, about half of the privatizations, for instance, in Brazil invo involved that kind of consortia. And the control block involved back then those uh, four uh, actors. Nippon, Japanese company, Bozano, a Brazilian group. A uh, pension fund from Uzi Minas and Vale, a pension fund of Vale. Back then, Vale was a state-owned company. This is a control block, right? So, uh, Previ and Vale were outside this control block. And this control block, and then the title of the presentation, is kind of a, uh, or, 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 uh, based on a shareholder's agreement, a kind of a contract that defines who will have the right to appoint uh, board members, etc., and the CEO. Right, and uh, all virtually all those uh, those uh, control blocks have this uh, shareholders agreement, and it's very important. Uh, and then, uh, so anyway, so this structure here in the shareholder agreements actually is the basis, in our opinion, to this structure that I have in Brazil with clusters and, and uh, groups of owners very connected with each other. So, and the exercise uh, in our book was to. Uh, examine around 800 Brazilian companies in 96, 2003, 2009, and see what happened in terms of those structures. Have many results, but one result is: suppose there's an index that can measure whether those owners are connected to each other in those groups and those clusters. Okay, I, I'm not show you. I'm not going to show you how it is computed. Very boring anyway, right? But you can see, you can read it in the book. Uh, and uh, so imagine, please believe me, that there is this index where we can uh, you know, compute the extent to which they are connected with each other through those, uh, those, those, uh, uh, those clusters. And what you see in Brazil is that uh, actually there was an increase in, the, in the, those types of structures. The Brazilian economy became more connected with more consortia, more groups, more owners linked with each other, several cross ownership ties, etc. Okay. And, uh, and just to give you an international comparison, fortunately, uh, there's this book uh, as part of this international uh, research team 
uh, and this book came out, The Small World of Corporate Governance. And unfortunately, uh, uh, we started this project 10 years ago, and uh, only, I think only, uh, only in our case, in the Brazilian case, we updated the data. But uh, anyway, I, 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 so the other data I'm going to show you uh, are from uh, 2003, but I don't believe it changed much, right? So uh, this index that I showed to you, uh, the Brazilian index, is similar to Mexico. It's 2.8 times South Korea. So even though South Korea has groups, etc., we are more clusterized. We have more of those, those uh, ownership connections. It's 5.1 times Italy. 7.8 times Chile and 12.2 uh, times the United States. So it's a very, uh, so we claim it's a, it's a very important characteristic of a Brazilian economy, corporate world. So, uh, and, then, uh, and then some cases now. So uh, why is this important? So let's go. Uh, with the first case, it's, uh, and actually it's, uh, it's very similar, or I mean the argument is, uh, is uh, in a sense similar to what Robert described. I mean, uh, you have this foreign firm coming in, entering a country, and there is this the, those powerful domestic actors, and there's this problem that has been termed in the strategy as a liability of foreignness, right? So, which is, you have a foreign firm in this case, it was a, a Canadian firm participating in an auction to acquire rights to exploit uh, some telecom regions in Brazil here. Then it, it changed over the years. This changed, uh, but uh, there was a consortium this, uh, that won in uh, '98, actually. So uh, this Canadian firm, firm TIW, uh, not surprisingly, created what a consortium, a consortium with a domestic firm opportunity in Brazil and a group of pension funds in Brazil as well. Very common structure. You see this all the way around. Very common in Brazil. Uh, TIW uh, had 49%, Opportunity 27 and Pension Funds 24%. So they had a shareholder agreement. Uh, but then somehow <coughs> Opportunity managed to change this structure and, and they uh, managed to create a new entity here, new tell. So 27 plus 24 is 51, right? So this new tell firm was created. Opportunity had a bit more shares then the pension funds, so opportunity had 51% of new tell, pension funds 49, and then bam, opportunity has control of the whole thing, right? So, and how this happens? Uh, well, I don't know precisely the details, but that's based on connections that the domestic guys get, had outside this particular group, right? Uh, especially con connections with the public sector influencing those pension funds of state owned firms to kind of change the structure. There. The, this is actually a case by Susan Perk Perkins, a friend of mine at Ke Kellogg, and uh, the title of his pa her paper is Innocence Abroad, right? <laughs> Which I, I think also applies to your, <laughs> to your case. So, and a comment by a telecom executive also mentioned in the paper is, it's always about ownership structures, it's all about how to structure the deals. Telemig, actually the Canadian firm, back then failed in Brazil because they did not know how to work with the Brazilians. They did not understand the ownership laws and how to work the system. Okay? So, this is a case of, uh, this is a case of failure. Uh, but then, uh, actually, in uh, Capitalism in the last there's this case of Uzi Minas that I, I frame it as a case of success. But the problem is that when you write a, biz a kind of business book and you use it as a case of success, the whole, Case changes over time. So <laughs> sometimes you have other conflicts coming. But anyway, so the, the story is, is uh, I think the story until, I don't know, 2008 or 2010 could be considered a success. Anyway, so Uzi Minas is a steel company in Minas Gerais, founded by this Brazilian president, uh, Juscelino Kubitschek. There was a moment of uh, uh, when the f company was created, very important moment. Even Bishop was here, and uh, then there's this Japanese executive. Uh, and the initial ownership structure was 40% of Nippon Steel, 20% uh, of government of Minas Gerais, so stayed, 40% uh, of BNDS. I mean, I see that those guys are were important since, you know, since well before. I mean, <laughs> so it's very common to have a, a, a foreign firm, a, a, a state-owned corporation, etc. cetera. Uh, and then uh, there was this uh, strong technical cooperation with the Japanese, and one particular characteristic, which is pretty, you know, 
characteristic of Japanese management anyway, was exchange of people. So they, they started, you know, sending engineers from Uziminas to Japan to learn and uh, implement all those Japanese practices, quality control, team-based, uh, you know, uh, uh, design, all those things. And uh, in the end, all those employees from Uziminas, they just love the Japanese. It was like, a, it was like a, almost a kind of a Japanese culture. And uh, if you take a look at the uh, shareholders agreement back in 98, uh, Nippon and the employees, they had to appoint four members of the directors, and they appointed jointly. So the foreign firms, the foreign firm and the employees together, and domestic Brazilian employees together appointing uh, board members, or the other players would appoint only two members, so they kind of control the company. Uh, there's this um, statement by, uh, by uh, an employee at Uziminas, uh, saying, with Uziminas approaching Nippon Steel, this, this guy is saying, well, with employees approaching Nippon Steel, with employees approaching Nippon, we would jointly have 25% of the company. Those are a great source of bargaining power. For instance, uh, Belgo Mineiro, another compact competitor could come to buy Uziminas, we would say, hey, hand slams on table, I have only 25%, you have to come with 26, then you share control 51. So they're saying, we are together with the Japanese. When, by 2011, and there were rumors that the Uziminas would be acquired by other firms, an, an union leader said, for the employees, the only move that will not bring uncertainty is if the Japanese increase their participation in the company because they have a long-run mentality. So that means that the informal, those informal relationships, informal ties, became important to support and part of uh, and joint, it became important to help support uh, and uh, actually, if you will, I mean, create a, 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 an informal foundation for, the for, for this formal tool, which is a shareholder agreement where they jointly appointed board members. And then new conflicts, right? So then, uh, okay, there was a success story, but then uh, new conflicts. In November 2011, uh, some shares of Uziminas, an important part actually was acquired by a group, uh, Italian-Argentine group, Technit. Uh, and then you had a new board composition, Nippon of Three, uh, this, uh, this other firm of three, Uziminas Pension Fund One, Employee Representative One, and you know that the employees are, tend to be aligned with Nippon, not necessarily the pension fund. There was even some dis disagreement, apparently, between employees and the, and the managers of the pension fund and representative of minority shareholders. Uh, then uh, Nippon is accusing uh, Technid of paying irregular bonuses to, to the executives. They're saying, you know, you're paying without our consent, you're paying bonuses and they, they, they decided to unilaterally, fi unilaterally fire executives, but then Technique accused Nippon violated the sharing, the principle of the shared uh, shareholders agreement. And now, uh, so uh, this conflict is underway, perhaps some of you is perhaps involved in that, I mean, I don't know, uh, <laughs> or helping them uh, as lawyers. Uh, but uh, as far as I can tell, minority shareholders are now trying to get some influence by appointing an external member, and there, there's some, you know, kind of negotiation uh, occurring uh, as a speaker, as I guess. Uh, okay, so just uh, to conclude, uh, in Brazil, uh, uh, there is this complex governance involving bo both formal and informal uh, institutions. Formal, you have, uh, of course, ownership, and then you have uh, this uh, kind of a this idea of a consortia, a consortia and you know, groups of uh, clusters, and then you have shareholders' agreements creating the rights to appoint board members and uh, the CEO, etc., voting rights. And then you have also those informal relationships also happening, which can mirror the, the, formal, the formal agreements, uh, but they are, can, can also complement, they can also bring new, new elements. Uh, 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 I think that in Brazil, those uh, shareholder agreements will still remain kind of a focal point where you kind of uh, institutionalize, you know, all those relations and uh, etc. Uh, but formal agreements, uh, uh, but those formal agreements may also be supported or breached depending on your or your the extent to which you, you understand all those connections that occur beyond the original agreement, and those connections can be between shareholders. That, uh, that align with each other, or between uh, shareholders and managers also, or employees, or other stakeholders, if you in the company. Uh, 
and, and therefore, I mean, the whole idea is simple here. Ownership involves uh, an interplay between formal and informal things that are occurring in the firm. Uh, and depends on this, you know, whether you understand uh, and manage this more complex set of network ties. Uh, and in a sense, ownership is much more beyond shares, it's beyond, in a sense, relationships. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sergio. Well, in favor of uh, our teenager audience, I was asked to skip question and answers and discussions. So I would ask Bruno uh, Salama to take the podium to make the final remarks and close this uh, beautiful gathering. Today we tried to look at the frontier of knowledge in contracts. And the frontier of knowledge in contracts has to be a development of long-standing insights um, for what, or over what has become transactions cost economics. And I was just thinking about the several cases that we were discussing today. And it appears to me that ultimately they can be framed as being representative of what is today called new institutional economics. So if we look at our cases, they illustrate in so many ways the basic traits of new institutional economics, which are the problems of opportunism, specific investments, and uncertainty. And they play out in the realm of contracts in so many ways. Now it's interesting to point out that the cases have to do with new institutional economics because that also shows what we did not talk about today, which is, in my view, the main competitor or, or, or adversary of new institutional economics in the frontier of knowledge relating to the economics of contract law, and that is behavioral economics. So I'm going to make two remarks uh, regarding behavioral economics. The first one, as we all know, the very famous uh, study in um, behavioral economics demonstrates that judges tend to be more strict on prisoners on, in uh, granting habeas corpus, right, when they're hungry. So people are harsh when they're hungry. <laughs> and the second one, which is also well established in the literature, is that the last impression counts a lot. So since we're all hungry and I'm the last one here, I'm just going to say thank you very much. Thank you.